We're joined on INSEAD Knowledge by Bob Ayres, Emeritus Professor of Economics and Technical Management, and Ben Wall, a Senior Research Fellow at INSEAD, uh, the authors of a new book called The Economic uh, Growth Engine, How Energy and Work Drive Material Prosperity. The, the basis of the book is that you're saying that economists are missing out on a major growth driver for the economy, and that is energy. It's energy as converted into useful work, what physicists would call useful work. And it's actually the useful work that's been the primary driver for the past century and a half, two centuries. Um, maybe information will be more important in the future, but it hasn't yet been the, the primary driver. So you're not just talking about um, oil, um, carbon-based uh, energy products? Well, most of, of uh, the useful work that's done in the modern economy is produced by fossil fuels. So in, in that sense, we are talking about oil. Um, but I think, well, if I may um, comment first on the, on the idea of the engine of growth, we do differ from the mainstream of uh, neoclassical economics. Uh, and it's interesting, if, if, if I can put it this way, that the, uh, our grandfathers probably thought the engine of growth, they were taught that the engine of growth was savings and investment, of course. In recent years, you've heard the opposite. You've heard politicians and, of course, business leaders saying, hey, spend, spend, go out, <laughs> spend. <laughs> because growth is, is driven by spending. But then, uh, Maybe growth is sort of uh, driven by itself. Uh, you could argue that uh, growth in the sense of increasing demand uh, gives you economies of scale, gives you experience, gives you uh, R&D that cuts costs, and so lower costs, lower prices, increase demand, and that's a, a positive uh, cycle, which, which in a sense describes what's happening. And, um, well, the, the, the standard neoclassical theory says that growth, growth is, is driven by technical progress, or they have other names for it, but something that you might call technical progress. And what we're saying is basically that, yes, it's technical progress, but it's a, it's a specialized kind of technical progress, which is primarily the efficiency with which primary energy from whatever source is converted into useful work and useful materials and eventually into products and services. What are the implications then of um, taking sort of different approach to uh, the, the classical model or theory? Well, the one that comes to mind right off the bat is that under the, the standard theory, if you will, uh, economic growth is independent of energy use, which suggests that growth can continue indefinitely at, the, at historical rates. And when people talk about recovery, implicitly that's what they're saying, that we're going, that right now we're having a hiccup or we're having a, a small case of the flu or something and we're going to get back to a trajectory of growth uh, that's sort of based on the last hundred years. But if we're right, and I think there's more than a small chance that we are, um, you can't make that assumption. It's a very dangerous assumption, and it's leading to, I think, potentially very risky uh, advice to political leaders. And, uh, well, for example, uh, we're immediately faced with a possible contradiction between the idea of taxing energy use to cut emissions, at the same time hoping that, that growth will not be affected. So uh, we've got to be very smart in, in the coming uh, years, the coming decades, to avoid that kind of contradiction. We've got to find ways of increasing the efficiency with which we produce useful work, useful materials, products, and so on, without necessarily increasing the cost. In fact, on the contrary, we have to look for ways of of producing that useful work cheaper. And for that reason, we're kind of looking around for uh, opportunities for negative cost solutions and double dividends and win-win uh, opportunities. These are very important. And unfortunately, most economists think they don't exist, but we think they do. 
I see, in, intuitively, I think a lot of politicians, business leaders, laymen, understand the importance of energy. Hence, we have this discussion about energy security. At the same time, we're having a debate about climate change. So there's an understanding, intuitive, maybe not accepted by, by the economic uh, community. But to layman's, energy is clearly a, of importance. And that poses the problem with the future. We've got a growing population. We hope that they become increasingly wealthy. That tends to lead to an increase in energy consumption. And what we're faced with at the moment is accelerating energy consumption. Add on to that the constraint that the new sources of energy should ideally reduce uh, their content of carbon to mitigate uh, the greenhouse gas effect. And in that situation, then the role of efficiency improvements to mitigate the demand for increased supply and at the same time generate more useful work uh, becomes critical. And this is really what our, what our work shows. And that, that intuitive dynamic that being more efficient in the way you use energy makes you more productive is what we really try and um, elaborate uh, to try and bring this intuitive understanding to the forefront um, and, and, and be able to express it more clearly to business leaders, politicians, individuals. Well, during the, um, the, the growth period, uh, we saw oil prices surging to well above $100. They've fallen back now. Um, presumably, once we get out of the, the downturn, we'll see the demand for commodities picking up, uh, the demand for oil. Well. And again, China um, striving to um, find oil reserves. And when growth really does pick up again, uh, unfortunately, we've got a big debt overhang to, uh, to get rid of first because a lot of wealth disappeared in the last few months, last year, but not so much of the debt. <laughs> So uh, going out and spending our way out of, uh, out of trouble is not, is not the full answer. But yes, uh, of course, China and India and the developing world and even the Western world will be uh, looking for new sources of energy. And I agree. Um, and the price will go up again. Yeah, there's a strong cyclical kind of pattern to this, and this is again something that neoclassical economics finds hard to, to deal with, this, this uh, dynamic and uncertain um, structure of the, of the economy in this sense. As the demand, or as the price of energy increased, and speculators jumped in on that as well, then uh, rec you know, uh, investments in the conversion of uh, crude oil into petrol, diesel, etc., pressure starts to invest in, in new refinery capacity, because this is really the real kind of um, bottleneck occurs. And uh, so over the past few years, we have um, planned investments in refinery capacity. Then of course the economy slows down again, demand declines, and a lot of that gets shelved. As the economy picks up again, speculators get back onto the, uh, the, the boom period. The prices spike again, people talk about investments again. And subsequently again, it's very likely that you, you might get an economic slowdown and those investments don't take place. So. Uh, we're warning against the kind of this, this cyclical behaviour of um, perceived requirements to increase capacity in refineries that then don't get uh, put in place and then demand picks up again. Um, so this, this, this cyclical pattern is something that the negative um, stemming from our requirements, uh, the, the absolute necessity of energy for economic growth. So in essence you're saying we need to be smarter in the use of uh, energy? Yes, very much so. Actually, um, slightly out of the main point of our book, but you could argue that the high price of energy last summer uh, may have been the trigger, or at least one of the triggers, that set off the the uh, real estate crash because it, it's by um, by increasing the living costs of of a lot of people who are already in trouble paying <laughs> for uh, adjustable rate mortgages. Um, the price of, re of real estate began to slow down or, or go down, and that's what set off the whole financial problem. Uh, I don't think that in the long run uh, that's uh, necessarily a model for what will happen in the future, but, but high energy costs are definitely a drag. And, um, and so it's extremely important 
to at least make the, um, the processes of converting energy into work much more efficient and, and, and much sooner than, than might happen if we just let the market take care of it. The market isn't going to work very fast because of the point that, that, um, was just, that Ben just made. As the price goes down, suddenly the investment stops. The investment in those, those alternatives needs to be accelerated and now ASAP. So is the book aimed at uh, an academic audience, economists, yes. essentially? It you're, is. you're trying to um, correct, yes. rectify the, the, the line of thinking? Yes, we, uh, we have to start there. Uh, it would be very hard to, to talk directly to political leaders uh, who listen to Larry Summers. And, you know. So we have to persuade the people who teach and, um, and the research community. And it's tough, uh, it's, a t <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a hard uh, sell. Usually when I get a chance to talk to them face to face, um, they uh, begin to nod. <laughs> but um, it's pretty hard to get into the main journals. And uh, one of the problems is that uh, the first reaction of many economists to what we're saying is that, hey, you're, you're explaining uh, growth in terms of something that's increasing, i.e. Uh, efficiency, but what if we just took the telephone use or, um, I don't know, not square lengths, but something that's increasing um, continuously? Well, we could, we could fit historical growth just as well that way, and so we don't believe you. We think you've cheated. And that's a reaction that's really common. Uh, we have not cheated. We, uh, and Ben's recently finished a paper which I think demonstrates that pretty well using very sophisticated statistical arguments, but it's hard to get people to read the, you know, so it's take, it takes time and it's a slow process. Making inroads into this monolith of, of research findings, these hundreds of Nobel Prizes, um, it's going to take time. But, um, if phenomena such as the, the, the credit crisis, um, oil price hikes, um, the pressure that the growing population is going to put on demand for energy, for water, and you think about water, it all has to be purified. Uh, in places like uh, the United Arab, Arab Emirates, a very, very large fraction of energy use is required for water purification. Agriculture, entirely dependent on energy inputs, in, well, industrialised agriculture, for fertilisers, for tractors, and all the rest. So this dependence on energy will keep on revealing itself, um, event after event after event. And every time one of these events happens, then people scratch their heads and ask, well, why did the traditional, why did our current way of thinking fail to provide us any kind of warning of, of this, 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 this event um, or any practical advice about how to solve this event in a pragmatic, in a pragmatic way that involves tangible, real wealth from uh, physical goods. Um, we don't get into the intangibles debate. No. The water story is interesting because you think about how much of the GNP is spent on water. It's a lot less than 4%. <laughs> And yet, without water, everything stops. So the implications are massive, then. If you, if you take this uh, different perspective, as it were, um, the, the way we would look at um, how the economy moves and is driven um, would change significantly. We envisage the economy as a materials and energy processing um, a kind of machine. Um, this is the, uh, the metaphor that Bob's uh, developed uh, over a long period of time. I called it industrial metabolism because of the analogy with, um, you know, inputs, processing, uh, and so on. We're specifically focusing on the energy aspect of it right now. And, and, uh, and I guess my con sort of concluding comment would be, uh, I guess I'm repeating myself, but 
if you if you look at uh, at, at the world from a risk you know a risk analysis risk management perspective, um, even if we're if uh, the leading economists only gave us five percent chance of being right, they should still take it much more seriously. <laughs> I think it's the reverse. I think we have only five percent chance of being wrong, but. <laughs> Uh, they should take it more seriously, much more seriously. Well, the book is called The Economic uh, Growth Engine, How Energy and Work Drive Material Prosperity. Thanks, Bob Ayres, Emeritus Professor at INSEAD, and Ben Wall. Thanks a lot. Thank you.